Yeah, call the meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah, no, people are signing in. Thank you and welcome to the May 20th meeting of the Post Falls City Council. Clerk will note that Councillor Hissong is excused and Councillor Malloy is missing in action. He's in the building. <laughs> he is in the building. We just uh, completed a workshop with the North Idaho College Board of Trustees and Mr. Malloy was there so I'm sure he will join us momentarily. Uh, ceremonies announcements. The 2014 Clay Larkin Mayor's Youth Awards will take place this Thursday, May 22nd at 6 p.m. at Camellon Park. Please join us as we honor the young people who help make our community great. I was looking at some information today and we've honored 2,200 or recognized 2,200 kids thus far. So very good program. And thanks very much to Alan and Spokane Teachers Credit Union for your continued support of the program. We really appreciate it. A uh, special meeting uh, Thursday, May 22nd at 7.30 a.m. The Urban Renewal Agency will hold a special meeting to announce selection of the design build team for the Greens Ferry overpass. This will be broadcast live on Post Falls City Council. Coffee with the Cop, it's a new program. It will be Wednesday, May 28th from 9 to 10 a.m. at Post Falls Coffee, 621 North, Sh North, North Spokane Street. Join the Post Falls Police Department for coffee and relaxed conversation as police and citizens meet together in an informal, neutral space to discuss community issues and build relationships. Talk about any issues and ask questions, and my understanding is the Chief's buying the first cup of coffee. So, <laughs> get one to go. On Saturday, July 12th at 8 a.m. at the Lynx Golf Club, 10623 North Chase Road, Post Falls, the Post Falls Scholarship Scramble Golf Tournament will take place. This nine-hole shotgun scramble is a great way to get in some golf while helping to support youth in our community. Open to all ages, early registration fee is $50, registration, uh, registered June 3rd through the 20th. Proceeds benefit the Post Falls Park and Recreation Youth Scholarship Program. Shall are there any amendments to the agenda? We have none tonight, sir. Are there any declarations of conflict? That would you present the consent calendar, please. Item A is minutes from the May 6, 2014 meeting. Item B is May 7, 2014 Post Falls Urban Renewal Commission Joint Workshop. Item C is payables from April 29th through May 12th, 2014. And item D is requ request to auction surplus vehicles from the Post Falls PD 38-2000 Kawasaki Police Motorcycle. Any questions? Nope. Yep. I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve the consent calendar as stated. Second. Motion to second for the questions. Clerk, please take the roll. Henderson? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Orson? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is a public hearing, and this is the Solomon zone change from R1 to R3. That I will. And if anybody wishes to speak uh, or comment, there are forms on the DIAs in the back and you can turn them into the clerk. With that, I'll open the public hearing. Mr. Manley. Well, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, John Manley, <coughs> Associate Planner here with the City of Post Falls. Introducing the Solomon Zone Change case file ZC-14-01 Zone Change. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to remind that first staff's going to do a brief staff uh, intro of the project, then the applicant will come forward, followed by a staff report. The applicant is Mike and Kathy Solomon and their representative, and the requested action is for City Council to review and approve the proposed zone change from single-family R1 zoning to high-density multi-family residential R3 zoning. The general location, as you see on this map, is south of Celtis Way and north of 90. And right at this location, you see the cursor is the RV park with the Flying J at this location, just east of there. And west of a subdivision on, this is Elm Road right here. 
The project size is 4.21 acres. The comprehensive plan designation is residential, with the current land use being single family residential. The current zoning is R1, with the water being provided by East Green Acres and the sewer provided by the City of Post Falls. This would conclude staff's intro of the project. Thank you. Any questions of John? Thank you. your name for the record please uh, my name is Chris Schreiber and I'm here on behalf of Mike and Kathy Solomon um, Mike and Kathy have been friends of my wife and I for about the past 10 years they built a barn for us when we first moved here we've kind of kept in contact since then um, I'm just gonna go through basically what we presented to the Planning Commission and then I'll open it or after your staff report I'll still be available for questions and so forth uh, as John just pointed out that's the property, and that's a 2013 aerial, just so you get an idea of what's on the site. There's a single family residence and an old barn. It's at the terminus of Corbin, if that makes sense to you, and it's right along I-90. Um, these are just kind of some of the stats and figures and so forth on the property in terms of what it's assessed for today, where taxes are today, who's providing water, sewer, um, who provides fire and police protection and so forth. And I, once again, this is just a quick review of where the site is in relation to other properties around it. It's the one that John just showed you because I stole some of his maps. I thought this was kind of an interesting way to present this or a way to start the conversation. This is um, the city's future land use map or comprehensive long range plan. And if you kind of look along I-90, you notice that this is the, one of the only pockets of true single family residential left. Almost everything has gone either to commercial or to some other higher density use. And that's pretty typical. You know, you're looking for a buffer between an interstate with 50,000 cars and you know, somebody's house. This is the zoning that you guys have. Um, the R, actually, it's highlighted wrong, but there, it's currently R1. We're asking to go to R3. So we're going from five units an acre to a potential of 18 units an acre. Why? This is kind of our logic behind doing this and I really had three primary points one we're just looking for the highest and best use of the site so right now it's single family and I apologize these are kind of small but I knew they'd get a little lost on the screen um, so first we're just trying to look at what we can do with this site what we can physically do with four acres what can we legally do with four acres what does the city want to see this site be used for in the future and that's what, why we came up with this R3. We don't have any plans to do anything with it tomorrow. This is a future, a long range um, concept for the property. What we were bolstered by is really what staff came back with and in indicating that you know, you've got about 1,000 acres of vacant single family as it is. What are the odds of somebody coming along and saying, hey, I want to build on I-90 and I want to build high end single family homes right on the freeway? That's kind of how we got back to this R3. So we're trying to fill a void in the market out there um, and, and create some land that's available for a developer. Maybe it's apartments, maybe it's townhomes, maybe it's condos, something like that. Um, the other thing we're looking at in the highest and best use is what else could we do with this site that possibly would create a buffer between um, the single family to the north and kind of to the east and the west a little bit and I-90 to the south. And uh, multifamily like this seemed like it would be a good fit for that. So it's the buffer concept. And then it's just acknowledging the housing trend and where the market's going in terms of providing more diversity, more workforce housing, more affordable housing, um, more options, whether it's seniors or, or whatever else. And then again, this is just, this is future. There's no immediate plans for the site. It's just we're looking for what we can do with this project or with this parcel long range. Um, and if, if nothing else catches your attention, I'm thinking that in our three zone on the property and eventual redevelopment with something more intense like an apartment complex would definitely increase tax revenue to the city. So when we took this to the planning commission, there were some questions raised um, by, by police, by fire, and there was one neighbor that responded. So I thought I'd just address those questions, um, kind of go through them line item by line item. So in terms of the fire and police both came back with questions in regards to access. 
you know, what's the roadway access? Can it handle what you're proposing to build on the site? Um, you know, and getting in and out and so forth. So I went out and took some quick pictures. These were from yesterday, just so you'd get an idea of what's there. You know, right now, Corbin is, uh, it's a 40-foot right-of-way that the city has, but it's paved 24 feet in portions. It kind of goes in and out as you go south on Corbin. The portion that's accessing the subject is about 18 feet wide, and that goes from the subject property north about 500 feet, and then it goes back to the 24-foot width. And if you drive down the street, you notice that the width widens right next to any new development, which is pretty typical. Um, when a new development comes in, that's when the road gets widened. That's when the sidewalks go in, that's when the curbs and gutters and all that fun stuff goes in. It's not there now, we recognize that. I think any developer that came in and looked at the site would recognize that. They know they're gonna have offsite costs. Um, I took some measurements on the cul-de-sac because I, I, I don't honestly I don't know what the fire code is in terms of how wide that has to be or how big of a turnaround it has to be but regardless it will be improved when you get to the point of permitting when you get to the part per, point of a site you know, review of, of a proposed project but just for comparison there's 90 feet in that cul-de-sac now that's paved and I looked at some of the other cul-de-sacs in the immediate neighborhood you know, Jessica's down at 75 feet. Casey, which is the um, kind of intense, not multifamily, but fairly dense single family right at the street. <coughs> They've got kind of a weird oblong shape turnaround. There's a little bit bigger. And then you got Lilac, which is right across Celtis, and I guess it's Sione. Am I pronouncing that right? Um, that's a little bit wider at 100 feet. Um, engineering staff here with the city indicated that at, if they did go to the full 24 width, the whole length of Corbin, then that would support at least 1,000 cars, car trips per day. This project at maximum um, density, which was, would be about 75 units, um, wouldn't produce 1,000 cars a day. So there's more than adequate width accordingly. And again, offsite costs are usually, or offsite improvements are usually done at the permitting side. Just another quick picture of what's there, just so you know. That's the pavement that's on site at that turnaround at the end of Corbin right now. Uh, there was a question that was raised in regards to sidewalks. I think it's a, a great point. Again, sidewalks are usually something that are implemented when development occurs, not necessarily in advance. You don't usually go out and start improving roads to nowhere with sidewalks and curbs and so forth until you actually have a development in mind. This is just a quick picture looking south on Corbin. Uh, you can't quite see it because our weeds are growing too fast, but on the, I guess it would be my left-hand side of that picture, you can see there's a little bit of a sidewalk, but it, the sidewalk really doesn't go anywhere right now. Uh, the, one of the other big questions that was raised was water. And of course, having been a volunteer firefighter and knowing what it's like to tap into a dry hydrant, um, that's a, a pretty important concern. So we contacted Green Acres. Green Acres is the water district that covers that, that area. Right now, there are two-inch irrigation connections to every pro or just about every property on the street. Um, that red line that comes right down the middle of the street is the, one of their main supply lines. It's a concrete pipe. Um, it's, he didn't give me the exact specifications on the pipe, but it's at least six inches. I think it's actually eight, but it's a, a six-inch supply line minimum. <clears throat> And my crazy red arrows that go all over there, that's just an indication of where there are currently hydrants in close proximity to the property. Obviously, none of those are servicing this property. <coughs> but again, when you come in for a permit or when you come in for site review, that's when you'd be adding um, hydrants either on site or in close proximity driveways or whatever. The good thing is that that main pipe runs right to I-90. So it's there. Um, these are just some quick snapshots I took as I was out there just showing where some of the hydrants are, typical development. These were two single family developments that come off of Corbin. Both, I'm guessing, are within the past 10 years. Both they added curbs, gutters, sidewalks, widened the road to 24 feet, added the hydrants at that time, street lights and so forth, kind of all came after everything else was, um, uh, uh, during the site review process. There, I, I just found it interesting. I'm not 
that familiar with how public hearings progress, although I've conducted them, I just haven't been on the other side. We sent out, or the city sent out on our behalf, notices to the 30 neighbors that were within the 300 foot radius. Of course, it's public notice and newspaper and all that. We only got one response, and it actually was a pretty good response. It was from one of the neighbors directly behind the property, and I'll show you where she's at. But I, I narrowed it down to really, I thought she had these five <coughs> points that were her concern. Number one was she was concerned about, you know, high density residential popping up in her backyard. I get it. I think that a lot of times people hear high density and they're thinking high rise, they're thinking Spokane, they're thinking Seattle. Our zoning in North Idaho doesn't allow that. You know, we're looking at, I think your, your max height restrictions in that zone is 35 feet for apartments. So you're not building a high rise, you're not blocking out the sun. Um, she was concerned about there's a, a road that comes out of her little subdivision that dead ends right at the property line to this entire area. It doesn't go to this project. It wouldn't service this project. There's no plans to extend that road. So she was worried about traffic. That doesn't go her direction. Um, property values, she's worried about, you know, building apartments that's going to drop our property values. I would argue exactly the opposite. Bringing in new development actually is going to put money back into the streets, into the sidewalks, into the sewer, into water lines, into safety, into everything else. I mean, there's impact fees, there's building permit fees, and then there's all the offsites that the developer has to do directly themselves. I, I, I kind of disagree with that one. She was concerned about the obstruction of her view, which I just, I, it, it kind of struck me. Um, there's no view easements for any of those homes so it's not like we're infringing upon somebody's rights per se even if we did build to the maximum you're looking at a 30 let's say a 35 foot height her house faces south it doesn't face west to this project um, her house is already elevated above this site my guess is is about six maybe eight feet is the grade differential there uh, she only has one window that, that could even look this direction or look to the west slightly, and that's on the second floor as it is. So I, I understand what she's saying, but I, I really think that development of this site, removal of the weeds and the barn that's falling down and is a fire hazard as it is, is probably an improvement in the view, not something that's going to be a big concern. Um, and then there was you know, some comments about low-income residents, what's that going to do? If this went to an affordable project, I would argue that diversity is something that, that adds to the health of the community, doesn't necessarily distract from it. Um, I understand our concern, but I think, um, I, I just don't think that that's necessarily the case. Just for reference, <coughs> the green is the parcel that we're talking about, the, the 4.2 acres, and this little um, single family residence is the one, one person that responded. Um, and again, there's about a 40-foot shared property line there on that. I, this is what I think of when I think people hear high density. They're worried about ending up in this scenario. This just doesn't get built anymore. We don't, even in Los Angeles, we're not building these type of projects. I mean, these are more suited for a prison than they are for apartments. This is what's getting built today. Uh, the two larger pictures are both Kendall Yards. Those are both apartments both 100% leased by the time they were built. They're not low income. They're market rate. Um, they're getting fantastic rents. I really could see something along those lines going on this, on this property. Um, if you look at any of the apartment complexes that are being built in Kootenai, or most of them, in Kootenai County or in Spokane County right now, tenants are demanding way more than they ever have. And the market's getting very competitive for amenities and um, finishes. So if you look at Kevin Rudine's project on Celtis, uh, just over the line into Coeur d'Alene, you know, that's 400 units now. And he's building all kinds of common amenities to that. Um, if you, even if you look at the, our primary affordable housing developer, that's Todd Prescott with Whitewater. All the stuff he's building in Riverstone is affordable. Well, that's hardy sided. That's top of the line, energy efficient windows. He's putting aside 30 years of reserves in advance, that stuff's pretty nice. I certainly wouldn't mind living there. 
So I think the concept of this old world stuff is, is gone. And unfortunately, sometimes you have neighbors and, and adjoining property owners and so forth that are worried <coughs> when they don't necessarily need to be. And I'll turn it back over to you. Questions of Mr. Schreiber before he steps down? Not right now. I did, I did I hear you right when you said that the maximum would be a single family would be 75 the density yeah it, the density um, in the zoning shows up to 18 units per acre oh 18 <coughs> per acre okay so if I if I did my math right and took 4.21 acres times 18 I get just over 75 I really think that by the time you put setbacks on it and you add the amenities that people want, you know, landscaping, parking, and so forth. Probably not less than that. Thank you. Mr. Mann, staff report. So the planning division did review this application and uh, Found that Don's place is adjacent to the east. Uh, there are some large lot single family homes to the west and to the north. I 90 is adjacent to the south, and then multifamily residential is often located near busy roadways, highways, and commercial uses. We denoted some of the diversity in uses in the area on this map, where you see in yellow uh, hash lines is the uh, single family homes. In orange, you see um, high density projects of nature for ranging from manufactured homes to apartment complexes. Red being the areas of some commercial type uses along Celtis Way and Idaline Road and adjacent to I-90 with some of that large lot development up in this area here where the cursor is currently moving and the asterisk is the site uh, requesting the zone change. The proposed zone change is consistent with the comprehensive future land use map. It's, it is to be recognized though that it's not in close proximity to most ordinary activities for those that don't drive. And that the current environment, as stated this evening, is deficient in existing sidewalks and existing pedestrians and bicycle facilities. The engineering division has commented that the proposed zone change is not anticipated to have any significant impacts to the city's sewer or transportation systems. Post Falls Police commented that they were concerned as well with the narrower road, mm -hmm. especially with the children and adults accessing either the schools or stores, and that uh, there currently is no natural or man-made barriers to reduce noise impact from the freeway noise. Kootenai County Fire Department, they did have concerns regarding the available water for fire suppression, but with further research, staff did find out there's no real, uh, with that large pipe going down Corbin, Corbin Road, there's really not a concern there now. The existing road width is 18 feet, and it would serve up to 150 vehicles at that site. And it, with the sewer improvements, with the site plan, it would be required to to connect the sewer, that with those improvements would widen that road to 24 feet. So at that time, that would include staff's report. Do you have any questions for me? Questions, for John? Linda. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, John. Um, on the recommended 24 feet, is that going to include curbs and sidewalks? No, it would not include curbs and sidewalks. Okay, and so to get curbs and sidewalks, you'd go back to the developer and have the developer give that right away to the city. Is that correct? Um, if with the zone change approved, they would go with what's required, and what's required would be to do, put the sewer and get the 24-foot paved surface, and that would not include getting the sidewalks there. But, but the right of way is 40 feet. It's 40 feet, but without, you'd have to require a condition, and if... Uh, you want to comment, uh, John, on this, but <coughs> with the zone change, there really wouldn't be that, to my knowledge, the conditions to get those sidewalks. And so that would come when the developer comes with the site plan? We don't have those conditions within our site plan review as requiring that, other than what's in front of their parcel. They could, so you have a narrow strip they could provide it there, but not outside going to the north up to Southeast Way. Mm. Unless we made it a condition of the approval. <coughs> we can't, this is we a can't zone. even really do that, can we? 
Right. Uh, John Cafferty, for the record, Mr. Manley and I discussed that. The city does not have uh, an ordinance that allows for conditional zoning or anything like that. So it's a zone change to R3 as requested, or it stays at R1 in its current condition. But we did explore that because we were curious about some of those things and it's just not uh, an option the city is taking advantage of at this point thank you questions thank you john with that clerk is there any testimony thank you We have uh, the first uh, person that wishes to speak, and uh, I've got to say this, welcome back, Mr. Rubin, is uh, Barry Rubin. He does wish to speak, and he is neutral, and I believe we've got three minutes on this part, as I recall. And we know who you are, but could we please have your name for the record? Good evening, Barry Rubin, Post Falls. <coughs> I would just like to present some generic questions to council which they might want to consider in their deliberations on this issue. The first one which was alluded to by the applicant is why, but I'd like council to look at that from a citywide perspective rather than the applicant's perspective. Why do we want to do this? Is it a means to an end to a specific objective or is it an end unto itself? Once that question is asked and answered, there are four other corollary questions which are generic but perhaps applicable. The first one is, what does the city gain or the people of Post Falls gain if we do this? What do we lose if we don't? And then the corollary is, what do we gain if we don't do this and what do we lose if we do? And just some general ideas perhaps you might want to consider in your deliberations. And that's all I have to say. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Bob Flowers is in opposition. <coughs> Bob Flowers. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Well, most of you don't know that I spent a good part of my childhood out on Corbin Park Road. And um, then I went away to the service and came back and they put a highway right in the middle of everything. But when I hear high density housing and post falls used in the same sentence, it makes my skin crawl. High density housing, in my personal opinion, has no business in Post Falls. It's especially out there. Of all the places to put it, them folks that bought all those lots around there zoned R1 so they could build their homes and have the space that they wanted and the peace and quiet they wanted are suddenly going to be have an influx of 75 plus apartments it just it doesn't seem fair to the citizens that already live out there that have spent their money on those homes because it was zoned the way it was and it's r1 a lot of the way around that not not quite the way that map dictated and on a personal side i guess where i live now approximately four blocks from my place there were some fairly high density homes or apartments in that and it seems to be where unfortunately a lot of the problems that we have in our neighborhood come from now i ain't saying that this had happened there but i'd sure like to hear what the police department really thinks of high density housing and what it really does bring to Post Falls. That's it. Thank you, Bob. No one else wishing to speak? Uh, with that, the applicant's got uh, five minutes to rebut. Good questions raised. Um, some of them hopefully we somewhat addressed in our presentation. Um, I get your comment in regards to sidewalks and bike lanes and how far can we go or how far can the city mandate. Um, 
they may, you know, the city may not be able to mandate, okay, Mr. Developer, you got to pave it all the way up to Celtis and you got to put bike lanes in and, and street lights or whatever it is, but you have to start somewhere. And if, if we want to see Corbin Road improved, if we want to see um, safety improved on that street, even if we're only starting with a small portion, we got to start somewhere. And you're not going to get that from a homeowner that remodels their existing house. You know, it's, it's going, only going to come from some more significant development. In this case, most likely, you know, a developer does come forward and they need to improve the road, if not for any other reason than just to extend the sewer. So when they go up and, and hook onto the sewer, which my estimate is somewhere around 700 feet from the property to that sewer line, they're going to end up tearing up that road. They're going to have to rebuild it. So now you're getting a brand new road that the city's not paying for. Um, and the same thing goes with now the sewer is extended all the way down Corbin Road. Now those homeowners don't have to connect, but if they do connect, they're not paying for it, or at least not paying for what the developer put into it to start with. Um, so I, I guess I would just stress that you do, gotta, you do have to start somewhere with some property, and why not start with something that's on I-90, you know, with 50,000 cars on the other side. If, if I were a single family homeowner on that street, I certainly wouldn't mind a buffer. I know, um, I think it was the police chief that mentioned there's no natural buffer now to I-90. I don't know that there's any plans to add a natural buffer, but if I was a developer looking at this site, I'd plant the trees, I'd build the building in the, the right orientation to start to create that buffer. Um, you know, in, in terms of high density, I totally agree with your comment. I don't think high density, technically, um, should be anywhere in North Idaho. I don't think we have it anywhere, but maybe downtown Coeur d'Alene, to be totally honest. Um, but our definition of high density here in Post Falls is this 18 units per acre. So on this site, going from R1, going to R3, you're talking about 50 units or 54 units additional. Because right now you can do five units per acre. This is gonna take it to 18. So we're not talking, you know, a thousand families moving in there. We're talking a maximum of 50 plus or minus families. And that's about it. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I, I have a question. Could somebody put back up that overlay that you had on there um, that was real easy to see what is out there? And cut, if it wouldn't be too much problem, can we just leave it up? Was that during my presentation or his? Um, I believe it was his. Okay. There's a yellow... Um, Line around it. A yellow line around it, I think. Oh, it's probably one of the first ones. No. Shall I stop that? Mm. She wants to speak. That one? Uh, yeah, that'd be, that would be good. That should be a, a 2013, maybe even 2014 aerial. Just Google Maps. Mm -hmm. okay. And are you the applicant? Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got his remaining... Two minutes. Oh, okay. And name, please. Okay, Kathy Solomon. Thank you. And when we, we've been up here 21 <coughs> years now, and we run a horse, you see, every time you drive by Highway 90 there, uh, we've been here 21 years building horse barns, and when everything right before it crunched, we bought that property, and we put a brand new house, brand new barn, and we had planned on fixing that nasty barn, <laughs> and then the economy crunched, and I got sick and stuff, so, um, it, sorry. But anyways, it's 700 foot of freeway frontage and we feel like it should be like I'm out there on the 4th of July with my horse is up all night it really shouldn't be residential um, I'm sorry I'm kind of emotional but I'm just asking that you go with the comprehensive plan and that you switch it because it's just really difficult to live there the way it is and so thanks thank you with that I'll close the public hearing council deliberation who would like to start Well, perhaps I get some feedback from Chief Hogue to address Mr. Flowers' question of high density housing in Post Falls versus uh, issues that the police department sees. I, I think that would be a, a better presentation to come back with some facts than, you know, just off the top of my head. I don't think it would be fair to anyone for me to stand up here and, you know, talk about that. It, it's difficult to. Uh, talk about high density you have uh, the apartments down at first in Spokane those are you know uh, apartments we don't go there you know at all but there are other um, apartment complexes where we do go there more often so um, 
you know, I, I can certainly come back and give a presentation on that, but it wouldn't be appropriate tonight, I don't think. And, and I appreciate that. And, and as a general takeaway, and I won't hold you this to the either, though, is that high density does not necessarily equal problems. That, that's correct. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that we have done um, in the past to work with um, apartment <coughs> managers to try to reduce problems in, in certain areas. Um, so, you know, again, I think that's something we could come back and give a presentation on, but I really don't want to have an opinion on this tonight. No, I, that's perfectly fair. <laughs> Thank you. I'll go. Well, I'm not really in support of this zone change, and I guess I've got a, several reasons. As Kathy mentions, it's not really a great place to live with all the cars and the noise and everything, and yet we're talking about putting 75 families in there which then increases the access or the, the traffic on Corbin Road. There's no way, no other way in and out of there. So you've, the only way in and out of that property is down that short stretch of Corbin Road, which then comes out on Celtese. So I foresee some traffic issues there. It's completely surrounded by R1, so I don't know where we go from here down, you know, in the future. Do we make that all high density? R3 or do we leave it as R1 and I think Barry kind of wrapped it up too and that and that was it I don't know that there's any real good reason to change that I think it's better suited for four or five families out there than 75 so um, let's see I think that's about all Thanks. that's my opinion but Ian. well I would just have to agree with Barry and with Alan it just does not seem like the right place for me or to have multi-family that many cars got coming and going there when it's kind of rural to begin with so i would say leave it the way it is and let those people have their r1 joe as the free market curmudgeon i don't think it's really up to us to determine what's the best use for that spot or not we obviously we don't want to have like a, a zoo with no fences and wild tigers or a big oil drill or something but whether where safety isn't an issue, any developer will determine whether that's a good place for somebody that somebody might want to live or not. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to invest millions of dollars into building apartment buildings that aren't going to sell. Um, you know, we're, I, I hate to have a, a tendency to micromanage. Um, if somebody doesn't want to live there, nobody's forcing them to. Um, if somebody does, that might be a, a, an opportunity that, you know, due to the location or whatever else, that maybe it's a bit cheaper than someplace else, uh, even with amenities. Uh, I don't feel it's our place to determine uh, to that great of an extent what somebody does with their own property or who's going to live where I think that people will sort that out for themselves and anybody willing to make that kind of investment will have that pretty well sorted before they do it I'd, I'd just comment not to get into a debate but uh, I also think that's one of the reasons we have zoning zoning laws is that uh, you've got to have some control you've got to have some have form some you control. have to have some logical expansion and continuation so we can we can talk about that and that different but we'll disagree on that one Kerry oh, I'm sorry Alan. Okay. duly noted that the our own planning and zoning commission was split it was a it was a tie uh, on our planning and zoning commission too and I usually pay attention to how those how those conversations go um, it does fit in with the comprehensive plan I agree with Joe on uh, not really micromanaging, but we do have a comp plan, and it does fit with that. I would be inclined, I would be inclined to approve that request. Linda, you want to comment? I'm sorry, Alan, you had it. But let's go, to Linda. We'll come back to you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm I'm basically neutral on the um, on the zone change. I I think that there is some um, something to be said for backing up to the freeway. I have actually um, had a, an occasion to be out that way, and um, I, I really, I mean, I, I think I believe, like Joe and Carrie do, that um, people have a right to develop their property any way they want to, and people who choose to live there, either choose to live there or don't choose to live there, um, I I don't know. I I'm gonna be I'm gonna be neutral. <laughs> I guess so, I would be too. Sorry. Do that. <laughs> that was allowed. You know, Joe and I are gonna disagree to a certain extent on personal property rights. I think, you know, I'm with uh, Linda. 
when a person buys a piece of property, you, you want to be able to develop that how you wish. But when you buy a piece of property, it's already within the city limits. It's already zoned a certain way. These people bought this property as R1. Now they're coming to us to change it. And I do think it's our responsibility because it's no one else's responsibility. Planning and zoning reports to us. It's the comprehensive plan. It's the zoning. This property right now in the city of, if, of uh, Close Falls is determined to be R1. If they've got a compelling reason to change it, then I think that there's you know, reason to change it. But I don't think the reasons that they presented are compelling reasons to change this from the R1, which is the way we've, as a city, have designed this to be, to change it to R3. So again, we can debate this at another time. <laughs> <laughs> but I stand by my... That I, I would make a motion to... Oh, sorry. Oh, you're, you're fine. I was just going to make a motion too, but I right. suspect we'd make different ones. So you got well, I'm going to make a motion so. to decline the request for its own change. Second. Motion to second. Further discussion. Clerk, please take. Oh, uh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, in in that sense, if if the city never changes any zoning, then what happens when, when Post Falls goes from a place of 2,000 people, which wasn't that long ago, oh. to now a city of 30,000? If you never change a zone, we still got all five acre plots out there. No, we uh, annex it in. <laughs> or annex it in. Um, but things change. Uh, as Mr. Flower said, you know, I, gr I grew up in you know, Coeur d'Alene until I was in my teens. But there were a lot of places that, you know, went from empty lots, uh, forested areas, to a couple of houses, to apartment buildings. That's, that's the nature of change. Uh, fortunately, Post Falls is a place people want to live, and um, they got to live somewhere. In terms of zoning laws, I do agree that there is there is a, a need for them. I mean, like I said, I don't want to be say, yeah, just go ahead and stick an oil rig in there. It's going to spew out pollution and noise and everything else. It's a safety hazard that's definitely decreasing property values. It's going to create lawsuits all over the place. Um, we're, going, we're talking about from one type of residential to another. Uh, that's why I use the term micromanaging. It's like, okay, what kind of residential? How big is the lot going to be? Um, you know, the city's growing. It's going to continue to grow. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. Can I address that? Sure. I, I would just say that, you know, during my career on planning and zoning, I, I did stand for zone changes, again, when there was a compelling reason. Mm -hmm. You know, the corner of Greens Ferry and Mullen was zoned R1. It's probably better to be CCS. Like, I supported that. I voted for it. So just because I'm saying that I, you know, believe in zoning and, and the planning of the city doesn't mean that I also can't see a situation where there's a good reason to change it. So just because I would say no to this one doesn't mean that if another one comes forward that I would say no to them all. So may I may I make a comment? Sure. Um, so Alan, in your years of planning and zoning, because I was there for several too, um, what what were your feelings about a buffer between um, uh, interstate and um, and an R1 zone? Well. I don't see a, an apartment building as being a good buffer. I would say that in this particular case, it, would, it should stay R1. Uh, the density, you know, it can go five units per acre. That means you could put 20 houses out there, but I would think that you would want a better buffer than an apartment complex with kids and, you know, uh, people versus what's out there right now, which is more or less a rural with couple of barns and a house so does that answer your question please take the roll that motion was to deny Wells aye Malloy nay Henderson aye Wilhelm was to deny the deny. motion is to deny mm -hmm. nay Thorson nay Three, so the motion fails I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move to approve the zone change as presented. Second. Motion second for the discussion. Clerk, please take the roll. Malloy? Aye. Henderson? Nay. Wilhelm? Aye. Thorson? Aye. Wolf? Nay. Motion passes. Thank you. I didn't comment because I knew I wasn't going to get to vote <laughs> uh, because we were missing a council person. But uh, again, it'll be a good discussion we can have at further time. But again, I, I saw no compelling reason to change it. I go back to all the, the residents who did in fact buy R1 knowing that that was owned R1 and it's just like in my neighborhood or your neighborhood, we had one in my neighborhood, 
uh, where you buy knowing what the property is, and then someone comes in and wants to put in higher density. And I think that's uh, that's not a good thing when someone's already bought. But motion passes uh, for our, our three. So thank you very much. Um, I am going to be sneaky now because I have got to be at my son's confirmation at 7 o'clock. And so I am going to, uh, the next time a business is unfinished business, we have none. The next is citizen issues. And I know we have one citizen that wishes to t address the council. I have already visited with him. I believe he's got some information to leave with the clerk. And so with that, uh, I, we already have the quorum. I am going to depart. Uh, council President Wilhelm will finish it up. And I apologize, but I know we've got the information coming. So with that, uh, citizens comment, if you want to come up, give your name for the record. Our on, yeah. 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 <laughs> and you're at the center of attention. You and I can. <laughs> we could sneak out. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor. Have fun at your confirmation with your son, council members. Uh, I'm Gary Jones. This is my son, Cameron Jones. And we're here this evening to ask for your help. Um, recently, Cameron and I purchased a facility here in Post Falls. It was the uh, previous site of Duncan Marine. Um, I'm sure you may be familiar with it. It's on North <coughs> McGuire. Uh, the site is 3.8 acres. There are two buildings on the site. One is uh, 10,500 square feet and is finished. The, uh, on the back of the site, there's a 24,000 square foot building that is uh, a complete building but uh, has only power um, it does not have facilities and it has a gravel floor it has been used for the past nine years to store boats RVs and motorcycles uh, when Cameron and I were doing our due diligence on this project and several other possible projects in the city we found out that the term change of use is very important um, the city determines whether a previous tenant and the incoming tenant are doing the same basic sort of thing or not uh, kind of based solely on their own judgment in this particular case Cameron is going to be opening a company called Post Falls Auto Auction soon where uh, dealers and individuals alike will consign cars to Cameron to be sold there will be an ebb and flow in the traffic we'll have a lot of cars on auction day then they'll go away Because of the change of use uh, question, the city determined that it was a change of use. We have disagreed with that decision right from the beginning. We really don't understand how storing boats, uh, RVs, and motorcycles is uh, any different than cars and trucks. Um, but because of their um, decision about this, two things happened. One, they required that the front building which is 10,500 square feet be fully sprinkled for fire suppression uh, this is a building that is made entirely of steel and concrete and there's no way it could burn but that being said we didn't fight the city on this we just spent thirty six thousand dollars putting in a new sprinkler system the next thing because of the change of use determination the city once did want that entire 24,000 square foot building floor blacktopped. This is a huge expense. Um, after Cameron having had many conversations with staff, uh, we believe that they have now decided that a chip seal application would be sufficient. This is still an additional $10,000 expense. We question again why there's any difference in the storage of this. The city told us that they believed that if boats leaked, they would leak internally and it would be captured within the hull and would not leak on the ground. We contend that most of the boats stored there had outboard motors that indeed do leak on the ground. Um, another issue is that Cameron will be from time to time needing to store heavy equipment in that building with track. If you have a hard surface, it's going to be very difficult on that surface when you have track machines in there. So we are asking your consideration in reversing the decision of the city to uh, require chip sealing of that rear building. We have a few photos that kind of make us question the decision. This is a, a site uh, on Greens Ferry that was available when Cameron and I were looking <coughs> for the building. Uh, it turns out the site was a little too small for us, and A to Z Reynolds has taken the site. Uh, 
uh, you will see there that uh, the city must have determined this was not a change of use, but there is all sorts of equipment, uh, U-Haul trucks, et cetera, stored there that indeed have the potential of leaking on the gravel. Uh, photos two and three actually happen to be City of Post Falls locations, and again, it's on gravel. There are some other issues. We do have a packet for each of you that we've left. Uh, there are some other photos there. We won't go into that right at the moment. So Cam and I are asking for one of two things here. Primarily, we're asking to not have to spend the money to chip seal that back building. If that can't be done, we're asking for equity. We just feel like we've looked around the city. We've seen many locations that are storing vehicles that do leak or have the potential to leak on gravel. And we don't know why we have been singled out to have to do this and others aren't. Um, it seems the decision-making process regarding issues such as this is rather arbitrary. Uh, we've included in your packet a uh, response from an environmental specialist that I contacted in Spokane. And he said, quote, typically drips from automotive cars are considered a maintenance issue and typically don't require action by a regulatory agency, unquote. Went on to say, in quote, that uh, leaks from vehicles penetrate the ground, quote, usually only inches, unquote. It seems in his opinion that storage that we're proposing would be a non-event. Council, we'll hum for five minutes. Right? Could I ask for about one more minute? That's to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> We've reviewed all of your bios, and Councilman Malloy, we really appreciate something in your bio that says, quote, my primary goal on the council is to attract business to Post Falls by minimizing the financial and bureaucratic hurdles to development and or expansion, unquote. We applaud and respect this decision, this position, sorry, but we have found it not to be a very easy process. Um, one last comment. We are truly invested in Post Falls. Cameron and his wife have owned a home here for six years. Uh, now he and I have purchased this facility for him to start a new business in the city of Post Falls. My wife Kathy and I own the trading company store's grocery store located on Celtis. Between all of these properties, we contribute in excess of 100000 in property taxes annually to Kootenai County. We want to see Post Falls grow and prosper, and we want to be a part of this. It would be especially nice to feel like we in the city are truly working together to achieve this same goal. We're Thank you for your comments. Um, what, you. We don't make any kind of um, response back to citizen comments. Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken those in. City staff is here. Would you like to say something, John? Um, I believe you properly addressed it, uh, Council Chair, or do I call you Mayor Pro Tem? I don't know. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's not an item that was properly noticed up, so it'd be a violation of the open public meeting laws for you to act upon that. And so if he wanted to bring this back at a future council meeting, that could be done. With that said, it's my belief that there are some processes to be followed before it actually were to end up in front of the council. You're probably, or your staff is definitely more familiar with those. It might behoove, um, the individual to go through those steps in order to avoid having to wait till the next council meeting to be told that they will have to be go through those processes for an appeal of a determination from the building department because I my belief and I can't quote you chapter and verse as I sit here but my belief is there's a process whereby uh, appeals and due process is afforded for determinations of this nature and I, I think that comes before another body before it makes it to the council so he may want to work with staff to see what other avenues are available. Just not, I don't want to direct you to not address the citizen's concerns, but I don't want to waste his time to wait two weeks to come back to then be told there's another process first. And so. And, and so did you understand what he's talking about? Well, I believe so. And we have worked uh, extensively with John Manley and Terry Werner, et cetera. And we were told that you were our next stop. So that's why we're here. And we certainly did not expect a decision of any sort tonight. We just wanted to bring this issue up. And uh, we don't know what the next step is, but we appreciate your consideration and letting us know what the next step is. Okay, so we will have staff 
let them know what their next step is Terry yes. is that right okay okay thank you for your comments thank you thank you is it out of uh, my wheelhouse as a counselor to ask for more information from staff at, on this issue or no and yes I forwarded two letters to you last week regarding this issue and if we do have follow-up from Russell Cornell that we can send to the, the council follow members this is actually this is the, the second time I've heard this exact same thing but from two different people now so I guess my interest is more peaked but right there were two letters that addressed to the steps that have already been taken that were written by John Manley and Russell Cornell that you should have received that were letters that they had also received right I'm, okay I'm referring to a different business too this, that this okay. was outside of council chambers I guess but a couple months ago anyway okay thank you uh, is, are you another citizen okay step up and just your name for the record All right. my name is Emily Hodson and I'm here with the distinguished young women of Post Falls program I'm actually just here to invite you all to our program this weekend and any community members who would want to attend if you're not familiar with the program it was formerly known as junior miss and um, it's a scholarship program for juniors in high school they are um, scored in five categories scholastics and interviewer scored before the program and then fitness talent and self-expression are um, performed for community members family members and other students so we have 15 amazing amazing girls this year who've worked really hard and I know that they would appreciate your support um, the program is this Saturday Memorial Day weekend um, it's our first year's chairs and we weren't really aware of that but I'm sure um, you know a lot of you have plans but if you're able to attend I know the girls would really appreciate your support it's a great cause and your own Carrie will be hosting um, for us this year so it's sure to be a good time <laughs> time and place uh, post Falls high school six o'clock on Saturday yeah That's thank all. you very thank much you. okay we're gonna move on to new business agreement with oh, the we got one more, looks like. oh sorry <laughs> hello Kim just your name for the record yes my name is Kim Brown I'm a, a past president of the Post Falls Historical Society and I'm here basically to invite the citizens of Post Falls and the council and mayor to a celebration for for Idaho archaeology and history month here in Post Falls at the Post Falls library on this coming Tuesday at 6 30 p.m. it involves our own John Mullen so I know that many of you will want to come and listen to the lecture by the associate director of the Idaho Historical Society Keith Peterson but more importantly tonight I don't know that many of you may recall that 25 years ago the Post Falls Historical Society was started with the vision of your predecessors namely uh, Kent Helmer who was mayor at that time and on the Post Falls Historical Society charter membership and on their board of directors were the esteemed mayors of Post Falls Don Camp Cecil Meyer <coughs> and City Councilman George Politis and Madam Mayor Pro Tem is that what we're calling you tonight Madam Mayor Pro Tem we also had yeah. your grandfather <laughs> so it, with that with the whole idea of history which is it is a a living breathing thing because we had a hundred members 25 years ago but guess what folks people get old and they die and those charter members have died so we are raising the raising the bar and seeking out our citizenry to carry the torch with the same degree of enthusiasm that was undertaken 25 years ago what do I mean by that we are encouraging our our council uh, skip a song is not here tonight but he has served on the post falls Assor historical society board of directors as has joe dollefeld so certainly within the city ranks we heartily welcome that kind of leadership but to the citizens of post falls the newcomers and the native the aging and the youth we encourage them to get involved with moving forward with our next phase of 25 years of preserving post falls history now many of you know that we have a museum just a couple of uh, a block away but the historical society were, has worked for years in making sure that the city was recognized with the Idaho city heritage Her city heritage program we want to make sure that we keep that program going in post falls many of you think may think that there there's also historic signage oral histories 
Terry Thorson, of course, I know she's working on preserving our newspaper heritage. Wouldn't it be great to have our own newspaper back here in Post Falls? But at any rate, in celebrating our town, the history is one thing that many of us love, and we are just offering the torch to be carried by our city government, as they always have, and opening up the opportunity for our citizens to get involved, volunteering at the museum, joining the society, and moving forward in keeping our history and heritage alive here in this wonderful town. At any rate, I'm just here to thank you. And I have a little packet that Many of you may or may not know some of the historic actions that the city has done, but I see that we have, of course, Dave Fair can tell you how signage has improved and things have improved in our park system. So it's not a matter of where we start, it's what we do and what we can consider to improve and share with our citizens as we move forward for the next 25 years. So raw, raw for our town and its history. Council. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. And thank you so much for your enthusiasm with the Historical Society. I honestly mean that. She, if you go to the museum or if you're in River City Leadership Academy, Kim gives a presentation at the museum that really is um, very interesting and very good. Are you going to speak next? I think so. Okay, so are you the agreement with the City of Rathroom to a, a, uh, purchase approximately one acre to be used for the radio telecommunication tower That's for me. law enforcement? <laughs> Chief Hogue. <laughs> Mayor and Council, good evening and thank you for this opportunity. You have in front of you a, uh, an agreement uh, with the City of Rathroom uh, for us to be able to purchase a one acre piece of property from them on Rathroom Mountain. Uh, we're requesting uh, approval to purchase this land for a, a backup communications facility on Rathrum Mountain. It's a one acre site to be used for uh, tower and site building as well as the necessary equipment. Uh, we required a conditional use permit from the county to be able to put this site on Rathrum Mountain and we went through that process in February and that was approved by Kootenai County. Uh, this is a picture of the property. I realize it doesn't uh, do a real good job of, of uh, displaying where it's at, but uh, you can see. It's in the woods. <laughs> it's in the woods. <laughs> yeah, it's in the woods, exactly. It's not on top of Rathrum Mountain. It's about a quarter of the way down from the mountain. Um, the city of Rathrum has a little over 600 acres, and this is just a one acre piece um, on their site. Uh, this is uh, some more information about um, uh, the site and what we're proposing to do. Uh, you can see here, this is the one acre piece, and then this is the 50 by 50 communication site that we would be building uh, if we're approved to uh, purchase this property. Uh, this is what the site would look like. Uh, this uh, communications tower here is our site on Blossom Mountain. It's uh, 200 feet uh, tall. The site that we're proposing on Rathrum Mountain would be smaller than this. It'd be about 150 feet in, in height. Uh, so the proposed agreement highlights uh, the property would be transferred to us, uh, that we would own the property with some conditions that the property is limited to the use for installation of a radio telecommunication site, limited to 200 feet in height for the tower. Uh, the city of Rathrum uh, is going to grant us an easement across their property uh, and they want it to be uh, an easement that can be modified, and we're fine with that. So in the future, if they would like us to access this property some different way, um, we are in agreement that uh, they can move the easement around. Uh, there's a limited amount of time that we can do construction on the site from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We're fine with that. And then the city of Rathrum has the first right of refusal. If down the road the city were for some reason um, wanting to sell the property, the city of Rathrum would have uh, the first right of refusal to purchase that. And the purchase price for the acre that we've uh, negotiated is $25,000. So this is the easement. Uh, you can see um, here is the Rathrum water tower and this easement uh, is quite a lengthy easement um, that they've uh, committed to give us. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the price of the property is as, as high as it is. They want it to get uh, to be compensated for this fairly significant easement. Um, 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of, of benefits to having this site. Uh, two years ago on Blossom Mountain, we took a direct lightning strike to our communications facility, which um, took, took us off the air for a short period of time. And it really uh, showed us that we need to have redundancy, we need to have backup, because in emergency services, we have to have that communication. So this will give us that redundancy. It will allow us to uh, work closer with the city of Rathrum. It will provide them bit, uh, better coverage. Uh, as you know, we dispatch for them, and so coverage is, uh, uh, can be a problem sometimes, so we wanna make sure that um, uh, we provide them coverage. One thing that I do want to state for the record, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back here to this picture that uh, is difficult to see. When we, <clears throat> when we laid out this acre of property, um, the, the property actually comes over to this edge of the road and then comes down and then comes just like this. The city of Rathrum would like an easement back from us so that they can access the rest of their property. And we're fine with that, and we will bring that to you at a later time. Uh, but um, you know, that's something that we'll work out with them at a later time to uh, to work out those easements so that they can freely access their property. So, with that, I would uh, stand for any questions that you might have. Any questions, Alan? Chief, I'm curious why we need a whole acre. That's a very good question. The um, county ordinance actually requires that we have five acres to put a communications facility uh, up. And so we did not want to spend that kind of money. We did not want to take that much property from them. So we settled on an acre. We agreed with that with Rathrum and we went to the county and they uh, uh, went through a, John, is that a conditional use permit or? or I believe it was a conditional use permit or a special use permit. Special, we went for well, both of special. them. So there was a special use permit that allowed us to, to build it on the, the one acre piece, but that's a requirement. Okay. And uh, the only other question is, where's the money coming coming from? Uh, this money for this project, we would fund this internally. The council's already approved that that funding, and then we would uh, pay that uh, payment back to the city using 911 fees out of our 008 budget, and that's already been approved in this budget year. Okay. And so, Chief, are you looking for a motion? Yeah, just a motion to approve the agreement so that the mayor can sign it uh, so that we can purchase this one acre piece from the city of Rathrum. Uh, John Cafferty, for the record, one point of clarification. I believe there is a more recent version um, of the agreement than the one that's before, that's in my packet anyway. The comments of Chief Hogue talking about uh, the right to modify the easement are not in this version, but I, I believe are in the version that the that was negotiated with the chief and with the city of Rathrum. And I think uh, I wasn't there, but I believe Rathrum signed that particular agreement last week. Was that? For you yeah, this there? went to their council on Tuesday, and they signed it. And that agreement was the agreement that was in their agenda. So is that if that's the incorrect one, that's the one that went on their agenda. I don't have theirs in front of me, so as long as you both sign the same one, it should be great, as long as you don't sign different ones. <laughs> well, I, I guess what I would ask of the council is, is that we could approve this tonight, and if it is incorrect, we will bring it back at another meeting and just have the, the updated one uh, approved. Joe? I move to approve the agreement that was signed at the Rathroom City Council last Tuesday. <laughs> second. Second. Motion and second. Shannon? Thorson? Aye. Wolf? Aye. Malloy? Aye. Wilhelm? Aye. Henderson? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay, we're down to ordinances and resolutions. Resolution authorizing consent to transfer from Time Warner Cable to Comcast. Entertain a motion. I would move to accept resolution authorizing the, the uh, change from Time Warner to Comcast. Second. Second. Motion and second. Clerk. Henderson. Aye. Wilhelm. Aye. Malloy. Aye. Wolf. Aye. Thorson. Aye. Thank you. Uh, any administrative or staff reports? Uh, Mayor Jacobson just wanted me to bring one item to your attention. We had discussions on the rotunda mural and the, and the debt on the rotunda mural that's owed back to the city. 
and that is being processed through finance. We did attempt to collect and did not receive any return phone call. Our um, certified letter was returned, um, refused, and so we will move that on just through our normal collections process and leave that separate from the Rotunda mural itself. We did receive some pictures that Carrie had taken, taken over at the uh, federal building that are very beautiful. And so we'll move forward with the Rotunda mural as a separate issue and just leave the debt to finance to collect on that piece of it. And I can answer any questions council might have regarding that. Questions? Okay. So have we agreed on a picture? Or? No, we'll move forward with putting the committee together and just kind of move forward and just leave the debt as a separate issue completely and um, move forward with the Rotunda mural itself as a committee. So it's not limited to a tile mural as had been discussed, right. so right. Okay. other. Fair enough. Good. Okay. And council comments? Carrie? Oh, you know it. You know it. <laughs> uh, 50 minutes. In 50 minutes, the polls close. Just a reminder. I was going to say. Uh, we talked about uh, distinguished young women. And a reminder on Monday, I don't know, does Ron have that on, on his? Monday is Memorial Day. And American Legion Post 143 is conducting Memorial Day ceremonies at Evergreen Cemetery. And the time this year and moving forward in future years is 10 a.m. And there um, is an opportunity also if any citizens would like to come out on Memorial Day morning uh, at 6 a.m. And, and I'm really quite serious. Um, say you have other plans for the day, but you want to come and, and bring your older children, they're putting flags in the uh, PVC pipe by all the veterans' graves. So there's an opportunity that morning to put flags up. Um, and as a bit of trivia for our very own Evergreen Cemetery, uh, Memorial Day is to honor uh, those who have given their life in military service and as, as well as all veterans, but that's the primary cause. But interestingly enough, we have at Evergreen Cemetery a Civil War veteran who is also a Medal of Honor recipient, John Wesley Conaway um, from Post Falls is buried there. But it, it, it's just, it's interesting. There's a, a great deal as, uh, as Kim Brown would know, there's a great deal of history in the cemetery too. But so I invite everybody out at 10 a.m. on Monday Memorial Day for that ceremony. Okay, Alan? No, I'm good. Thanks for sharing that. I didn't know we had a veteran like that. Yeah. Well, I would just like to, um, again, congratulate the 2014 uh, veterans stand down at Kootenai um, Fairgrounds. I was there last week, and there were 1,500 veterans there, and it was a very moving morning, and I just really appreciated being there, and I'm glad that they found some help and some comfort there. So for all the volunteers and the sponsors, I would just like to thank you all for that. And it doesn't look like we need an executive session. And the next motion would be? Adjourn. To go vote and adjourn. Okay, have a great night. <laughs>